Miggity Mike, check, check, check one. And we are rolling with another episode of Industry Interviews. I am your host and good buddy, Dan Brown Jr., creative director and composer of the Emmy-nominated Grime Sonics. And today, I am joined by composer, instructor, and Logic Pro 10 guru, Mr. Ryan Rake. Talk to me, brother. What's going on? Hey, Dan. How, how you doing? <laughs> Honestly, dude, I threw my back out two days ago, so I'm, I'm in a lot of pain. <laughs> How did you do that? Um, you know what's funny? I carry stress in my lower back. Uh -huh. and anytime anything's going on where it's out of the norm, I just tell you what, I just throw my back out, and then I'm like chilling for two or three days. It's the worst. That's kind of a bummer. <laughs> yeah, it is a bummer. So, hey, you asked, let's start this podcast on a downer, right? Let's switch <laughs> Hey, before we jump into yeah. your book, Audio Production Basics with Logic Pro 10. Is it Logic Pro 10 or Logic Pro X, by the way? Um, you know, I hear people say it both ways. Right, um, exactly. I want to sound like I'm in the know. So I'm going to, st I'm going to stick with Tim. But, okay, so before we jump into like your book, your, you know, writing the book, the whole process, publishing it, getting out there to the world. Yeah. I want to learn a little bit more about you as a dude so where the heck are you from dude sure um i'm from the bay area um cool. yeah grew up there my whole life um i'm currently living in antioch which is kind of on the outskirts of the east bay um for anyone yeah. in the know of the public transit line it's it's one of the last stops on bart which is the uh, big transit system uh, in the bay area is that um my wife my wife and I, we, we travel up there pretty frequently um, when the huh. world is normal. And uh, is that near Emeryville at all? or? Uh, not really. Um, I mean, you're, you're in the right general zone of the Bay Area. That's kind of like the, the it's technically the east side of the Bay. It's yeah. north. I'm on the north and east, but uh, put another like 30, 40 miles between, between those, and that's where we are. So, Way up um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just the way that the the freeways are connected, but um, it's not it's not difficult to get out that way. So, if, you know, Emeryville is pretty pretty easy to get to. It's pretty cool, man. And then, married guy, kids, talk to me. Yeah, so I'm married to my wife Audrey. Uh, we've been married for uh, nearly seven years now. Um, coming up soon in July, uh, we have one. Uh, child. We have a girl. She actually just turned uh, 16 months today. Oh, fresh baby. Um, fresh baby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Welcome yep. to dadhood, right? 16 months late. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. It, and look, our guy's 12 and it goes quick, dude. You always hear That's that. what you said. Yeah. I mean, it's that's what I hear from people. And you. I think you've made that comment before. Yeah. And sure. yeah, it ain't no joke. I mean, the months just keep flying by and um, it's fascinating cause they're learning and you're learning and, um, it's awesome at the same time. One of the things that, um, I did really inadvertently when, uh, you know, since my son's been born is I, I'm, I'm always taking photos of him, dude. I'm always sharing them on Facebook and it's been so great uh -huh. every year you get those memories. And so I just keep getting to see all these photos that I forget that I take yeah. them all the time. And you know, what pops up on my feed doesn't look anything like the little monster that I got in there now. It's so cool. Super cool. Okay, so <laughs> fill me in. Um, from Bay Area, love that area. Actually, we're considering moving to that area. Um, hmm. When did you decide you were going to get into music? Is it something that you've always known that you wanted to do? Um, yes and no, I guess. Um, I don't don't come from a musical family in, in the traditional sense you know i've got family members who you know plunk around on various instruments but nothing beyond just kind of a, a side hobby if if that yeah. um i i can remember as early as elementary school you know the discussions of starting bands with your friends and uh in my mind i was always kind of imagining the the what it would look like performing having no idea what it would actually take to do and um it wasn't until middle school that I kind of picked up the guitar and uh, a couple of close friends of mine, um, we were all into uh, classic rock and punk and, um, you know, learning those kinds of things and jamming around. And I had a buddy in high school that I would jam with 
all the time. We were, you know, we're still best friends today, which is great. Um, but we, we would just jam all the time. And, um, I was starting to write, um, my own songs or at least my own ideas on guitar. I wasn't much of a lyricist, um, in that respect. It was more into sort of the musical aesthetic of things and, and what stuff sounded like on the instrument. So I was into effects and all that. Um, and when it came time for, uh, for college, up to that point, I, I had been self-taught, you know, learning from friends or song tabs and things like that. And um, didn't know how to read music, but um, got into college and uh, kind of had to make a choice where it was like, okay, um, what, what am I going to study? You know, and I knew that there were a couple of things that I enjoyed. And I was thinking, well, you know, I, I love music. I love playing music. Um, people are always saying you should be doing what you love. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to study music. And, and there's an extra bonus because, you know, it's music. You don't have to write papers. You don't have to do all this other stuff. And boy, was I wrong. Um, as you know, um, going into studying music, there is so much more. I mean, you end up doing double the amount of work because not only are you doing the regular coursework in school, but then you're doing all the other full-time music stuff on top of that. And, uh, you know, that's how I kind of dove into this stuff um, and kind of pursued it. I even went further. Um, I got my master's degree um, in composition. And if I was thinking that I never would have to write papers, I was even more wrong with that because I had to write a thesis. And that thing is like, you know, an inch thick yeah. book of an analysis of a, an orchestral piece I had to write. So, I mean, it's, I had to write way more than I expected going into it. Um, when did but you yeah, that's with your master's. Uh, say that again. When did you graduate with your master's degree? Um, so I finished up my coursework in 2012, um, and I didn't finish my thesis at that point. I, I had finished my courses, and I decided to kind of leave the school environment and try to enter the the professional world. I guess. Um, so I didn't technically finish up my thesis, and you know put the double bar line and all that stuff and get it done until 2015. Um, so that's my technical graduation time, but uh, I've been sort of out of the school environment in that respect since 2012. Okay. Congrats on the masters. Uh, I am right there with you, you, man. It's good to be out of school. <laughs> it's good to yeah. be done. It's, it's fun while it's there. And then it just seems to never want to end. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's good to be good. It's good to be done. Um, so you graduate, then then what do you do? What does life look like once you have you know paper in hand, plaque on the wall? What are you doing? Yeah, well, it's it's kind of what you just said. There's a there's a plaque in hand or a paper on the wall, and that was kind of it for the initial run. Um, I, in hindsight, after that moment of kind of leaving school, I realized how much I wasn't actually prepared to leave school. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think what, what I did notice was um, I, went to, uh, I went to Cal State East Bay, which is in Hayward, which is in the Bay Area. Um, and the music program they have there is, is what I might consider like a traditional music program where, you know, you study classical or jazz. Most things were classical, though. Um, and so the, the pathway that they kind of uh, guide you to or, or suggest to you is a, is a pathway into teaching. No. Um, I mean, as much as you're studying composition, thinking you're, you're going to be a professional composer, it, it didn't seem like we were given the tools in the same way. And I'm not trying to knock the school in any way because I, I totally enjoyed my time there. I had fantastic professors and some really amazing mentors during that time. Um, and I'm event, you know, immensely grateful for that whole experience. But yeah, I, I, I finished coursework in 2012 in the summer. Um, I connected with a friend that I had met at a summer arts program and they had an open room available in um, the lower hate area of San Francisco and kind of on a whim, I was like, yeah, I'll take the room. And so I moved out there with no job, no prospect for anything, just a small amount of savings. Um, and so I was kind of at that time doing what, what you do, you know, checking Craigslist, checking job sites, um, I was looking for teaching jobs. I was looking for 
composition opportunities, um, really anything um, that was music related. And, and that was where I started realizing I was not really prepared to dive in um, in the same way. So yeah, that's what it looked like in the immediate um, aftermath of, of school. I mean, fortunately, I landed a, a teaching teaching job um, at a private um, private middle school, high school in the Bay Area called Fusion Academy. Um, and their model was based on like one-to-one teaching. And I had done, you know, private lesson teaching while I was in college as a way to kind of make side, you know, side money and everything. Um, so I was, you know, ready for it to dive into that kind of thing. And um, that was great. And then another opportunity opened up for teaching at my, um, my alma mater school. And then that led to a, another opportunity to teach at um, Pure Mind Studios, which is where I currently teach. It's a, a music production college in San Francisco. Um, and then after that led to another teaching um, opportunity at Diablo Valley College, which is in Pleasant Hill, um, another Bay Area school. And that's where I also currently teach. So it took, you know, a couple of years to, to get some momentum going. And I'm still teaching a variety of part-time gigs. So it's, you know, it hasn't led to a full-time thing, but that's been kind of the bulk of my, uh, my living or income that, that kind of sustains what I do. Um, what, yeah. Do so teach, what, what do you teach at Diablo Valley college? Yeah. So at, at Diablo Valley college or, or DVC, um, that one is, it's in the music industry studies program. Um, so I teach, uh, intro to music production and multi-track recording. So there's, there's a studio, um, on campus that is outfitted with a, a live recording room, a control room with a bunch of rack mounted gear and analog console and some really awesome goodies that you don't find in really any community colleges in in the Bay area. Um, so I teach a class like that, um, as well as the advanced level of it. So it's, that one's going into learning and you using, um, studio equipment and technology to record. So we have a lot of people who are musicians who come and take that class who are interested in learning recording. Um, we have some more advanced students who are just trying to get more access to this kind of equipment. So that's what that one's geared towards. Um, I also teach an AV essentials course, which is um, kind of a survey introductory course into the world of audiovisual technology. So it's um, still in the realm of music technology, but geared more as a as kind of a broad look. Um, in previous years, I've also taught an introduction to Pro Tools course there. Um, but if, if anyone who's familiar with, with um, kind of the teaching world, you kind of hop around um, based on the needs and based on enrollment and funding and all that kind of stuff. So at times things shift, but I've been consistently doing those two courses um, more so than others currently. When did you decide you wanted to write a book? Yeah, that's because I just said I wasn't really interested in writing, right? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of ironic. Um, yeah, it, this was an interesting opportunity that that popped up due to my relationships at Pure Mind, which is the production college. Um, one of my colleagues there is uh, Eric Kunal, who has worked with Frank D. Cook, who um, some of you might know is like, the author of those Pro Tools 101 books that everyone gets when they're going to do their certifications. Um, so Eric has has been working with um, with him for for years, and he's authored one of the Pro Tools books as well. I think it's the Game Audio one. Forgive me, I don't remember the the exact number or name right now, but um, they've had a partnership for a bit, and so they work for a company called Next Point Training. And they're developing some new, um, some new content and um, training training books. And I think a couple of years back, they put out a similar title, an audio production basics with Pro Tools First. And they were trying to kind of create a series of training materials that would be geared towards beginners, um, and primarily in like a 
middle, high school, college level, like a, kind of everything. Um, so Eric knew that I, I had been teaching the logic courses at Pure Mind for a couple of years, and they were looking to develop a, a version of the book that incorporated logic instead of just Pro Tools so that they could expand what they've got. Um, so about a year ago, you know, it was just kind of a, a mention in the hallways, you know, like, hey, would you be interested? And I was like, yeah, of course. You know, I that was one of the, the things my one of my mentors had, had taught me is if an opportunity pops up, you should probably say yes in most cases because um, you never know what's going to happen. And it took about a year before we actually started talking about specifics. And um, I was even though I'm not interested in writing um, as a big part of my life, um, I, I could clearly see that this was an opportunity worth jumping on. Um, knowing the the people involved and, and knowing the quality that was likely going to be there. It wasn't just like a friend saying, Hey, we should write a book together. I, I knew that they had a proven track record, good quality materials, and, and that it likely would be a um, positive experience. So, I said, yeah, eventually we started working out the details and, and got a schedule going. And um, that's ultimately what led to me deciding to write a book. And, and really when I say write, it, you know, we, I co-wrote it with another colleague, Harry Gold from Pure Mind as well. Um, and, and we had a, a lot of support from Eric and, and Frank um, as far as how the, the production was going of it. I'm sitting here looking at the cover and I'm just curious about the whole process. I'm sure our listeners are. Talk to me about the process of having a conversation in the hallway and then starting the creation of the book. So let's, let's talk about that first, about how yeah. you divide up the workload, but then talk to me about how once the book is done and uh, editing and proofing and graphics and, getting it published, the whole nine. Walk me through the entire process. Sure, yeah. Um, so one of the, the really amazing parts of this process was that this book is a part of a series that's already more or less established. So we had a lot of, um, we had a lot of guidance and formatting that was ready to go, meaning we knew how it was going to be arranged. We knew how the content was going to be laid out. We knew kind of the um, the unfolding of the material. So it really was about connecting logic with the way that that content was going to be delivered. So we, we were fortunate that we didn't have to kind of come up with everything from scratch from zero. There was already a, a template in place, um, to keep the, the continuity in place. Cause the, the point of, of what they're trying to do is, they, they want it to be that, you know, if somebody's got the logic book, if somebody's got the pro tools book, if somebody's got the Cubase or Ableton ones, um, you know, if you follow it more or less on the same track, you could be hopping around and everybody's pretty much doing the same thing. So it's really great um, as a, as a training procedure to kind of keep a cohesive learning experience. So we had that going for us, which was awesome. So that stuff was already in place. Um, so we didn't have to start from scratch. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, the distribution of labor, the distribution of work was kind of a, a toss up, I guess. Um, there, we were kind of presented with a question um, of how we would like to split the workload. Um, Cause Harry and I were, were both working. We, we didn't actually um, coordinate together like in a room or anything. Occasionally we, you know, we might have an email um, to, to kind of figure out where we're, where we're at with things, but, um, we were pretty autonomous. Um, and so the question was sort of like, do you want to do like an alternating, um, chapters thing, or do you want to do like the first five and the last five, something like that? That was sort of a question that got through around. And, um, ultimately it, we, we kind of unanimously agreed to kind of alternate. So the idea being that one person wasn't left with all the kind of introduction material and then the other person left with maybe the more advanced tools, we were split up and kind of doing um, kind of an equal amount of exploration into the material. Um, 
so that's that's how we we split up the work um and like i said we we had a template to follow um so we were kind of just going through it and making sure that we could uh, align the concepts and tools and things in there to to make sense for the software but also for the 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 training materials um for any any like figures or images that would be included within the chapters we would make those ourselves along the way um i i wasn't sh this was an interesting thing for me cuz um one of my one of my mentors from Cal City's Bay my my private instructor um Dr. Rafael Hernandez he is like a multimedia master um he he ran a a multimedia content group that I was in while I was in school and so he had this really good attention to detail in terms of design font layout like the aesthetic of everything and really setting a brand you know um and I'm sure you're aware of that I mean you're you're branding with with Crime Sonics is totally on point you know um so it's it, he he's got that kind of eye you know where he knows how things are sort of working so as I'm, I was going through the the process I was kind of concerned like okay what's the standard what's the the quality requirement what what is being asked of me in terms of providing visual media for this so there there wasn't a a straight answer from the onset so I just tried to make sure I took the best quality screen captures that I could and I was doing this on a just on a MacBook Pro and um, using the standard um, you know, screen cap software that, or, or not even the software, just the feature that, that comes built into the OS um, to capture all of my screenshots. And what I tried to do is just be as um, consistent about what I was doing in terms of how each image was supposed to look. So um, I would take a screenshot and then I would go in and, and edit so that the borders were all the same kind of look, you know, yeah. I always hated opening up a book and seeing like one image looked one way, another one looked another way. And it just seemed, you know, unplanned. So, um, that was my, my perspective going into that. Um, the, they, they ended up kind of, I think they had their own editor, um, not, not in-house, but there was, there was already a connection with the, um, Roman and Littlefield uh, publishers. Uh, there was already the, the arrangement with them. So there was, they have an editor, they have kind of some production folks that I, I didn't get to interact with, but um, they were there to kind of take care of things. So um, I would do my edits. I would write up my chapters. I would send them over to Frank. Um, Frank would give them kind of the first look over um, because he's got the, the the knowledge of working with a DAW and what a, a technical manual should look like like this. Um, he might shoot me a question back to be like, hey, you know, if I hit this button, is this going to happen? Like he just wanted to double check that things were going to work a certain way, um, you know, so that the user would, would have the same experience. And then he would send that off to the publisher's editor. And then that editor would go through and do whatever they needed to do um, to make sure everything made sense from that, that point. Um, and then, yeah, that, that was the process for that. Uh, the May I, let, me, let, me, let me jump in real quick. Sorry. Sure, I, sure. I might've missed this, but how long from start to finish was the creation of the book? How long did it take? Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I'm trying to think of the, the timeline here. I think we were sent, uh, I want to say, I think we were sent a contract in like August of 2019, something like that, where it was like, here's the conditions, here's the, the general um, schedule of things. Um, we were then sent over the templates. Uh, they were like Microsoft Word documents that were laid out in the way that they needed to be. So we would go and start inputting um, our content. Um, and I think we had a, a final delivery date of like, I want to say mid October, something yeah. like that. So um, it, it roughly broke down to if we would have jumped on it right at that moment, maybe one chapter every two weeks per author. Yeah. 
yeah. something like that. That was kind of like what the intended timeline was. So we were looking at five chapters each, so 10 weeks. Um, but we had a, we had a couple of, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember exactly what, what it was, but um, I don't remember having everything I needed to start right from the day that I signed the contract. I think I was still waiting for some files um, or waiting for certain content. So I think that ate up a week or two, um, which means then technically it's less than two weeks per chapter. Um, and then w for whatever reason, reason we had kind of a slower start into it, but we still had the deadline, you know, the deadline never changed. It didn't move as things shifted. Um, so it ended up being like a chapter a week by the time I was actually sitting down and doing it. Um, so, you know, it was a short time frame. I mean, that, that's about two to three months of my involvement being in there to when I needed to be like, yes, I'm done. Um, I think we, we had about a week or so buffer, like Frank had already designed that into the schedule, yeah. knowing that you usually need some sort of buffer just to double check if the editor comes back with anything. So he's done this enough times that he, he had a good production schedule ready to go. Um, which was really smart cause he was right. We did, you know, we did need that extra week or so afterwards, but yeah, it was a pretty quick, um, yeah, it sounds like it was really thing. fast actually. And so when you, once you delivered your first, I, don't, I guess I want to say first draft and then you got some revision notes and you, you got that squared away. From the moment you sent the files off and you guys hands off, you're done. How long from that point does it take to do whatever it does before it's available to the general public? Yeah, and that's that's where um, I, I would wonder the same thing a little bit. Um, I think looking back at my chain of emails, the final approval revisions I think were were signed off at like the beginning of December, something like that. Oh. Um, so somewhere in that time frame. So we had we had the time to to do our final review, our final check, and any fixes that needed to be done. Um, and then it went off, and I didn't hear anything for a while. Um, I think the you know it was just kind of like radio silence but I was busy. So I wasn't thinking about it. Um, busy with the baby, busy with work. And then with the, the pandemic stuff, you know, it just kind of slipped my mind as far as something to be checking on, you know, I'm interested to know about your scheduling during the writing process of the book. How did you balance your schedule between your teaching engagements, the family, if you were writing for production music libraries and the book, I mean, I mean how did you balance your day to day? Yeah, it was, it was definitely tough. Um, I, I teach, um, at the two schools part time and I'm teaching like three days a week, which leaves me with two free days and then the, the weekends. Right. Um, during, during the days that I would teach, my wife would coordinate her time off at her job. So she would be able to, to watch the baby during that time on my days off, I'm watching the baby full time. Um, so it, I didn't have a lot of free time. Um, the between grading, um, lesson planning, actually teaching, sitting in traffic and driving and then watching the baby, like from morning until night. Um, my only time to work is really once the baby goes to bed. Um, and that's usually somewhere in the pocket of eight or 9 PM. Um, and at that point, you know, I've been up since seven or eight in the morning. Like, you know, you gotta have eyes on the baby the whole time. Um, and so I'm exhausted at that, at that time of day. I mean, it's like, that's a full 12 hour, um, worth of active effort. Like no, no sitting and lounging. Um, so I think during those times, especially during this, this period, um, working on the book, I was trying to squeeze in a little bit of writing during nap time. Um, so she would maybe nap once or twice in the middle of the day for about an hour each. If I'm lucky, I could sit down and get focused and do a couple of edits, but my process is a little slow. I kind of need to sit, 
I, I need to decompress a little bit, let my mind start to expand and then I can start working. Um, so by, sometimes by that time, like I'm hearing the cries, you know, and I didn't get anything done. So I was spending a, a good number of, of late nights, um, staying up into, you know, after midnight, one, two, three in the morning, uh, in some cases, usually the night before something was needing to be done. Even if I paced myself well throughout the week, there was always these little things that need to be fixed. And I was sometimes pulling close to all nighters, um, a couple of times, like reminiscent of the days of being in, in school, you know, working on something. Um, so it was, yeah, it was pretty exhausting. Um, and I, at that moment I wasn't doing anything else on the creative front. So, uh, no composition, no, no fun. I think maybe when I'm like able to sit on the couch for five to 10 minutes, I can maybe watch a YouTube video and, and laugh for a minute. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, it didn't leave a lot of room for, for anything else. And by the end of it, I was super relieved cause I was, you know, pretty exhausted out of the process. I want to camp out for a second and, and talk about that kind of discipline and work ethic. Um, yeah, I, I remember when I was doing my master's program, it was online and we were currently living in Los Angeles and uh, my master's degree is in, uh, in instructional design. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I actually landed a job as an instructional designer at a college in Florida while I was still doing my master's degree. And it was, it was a great opportunity. And I thought, you know what, <clears throat> let's do it. And so, you know, having just an incredible amount of workload to do that kind of, you know, degree online, then taking a new job, packing up our house, moving all the way across the country. And I would drive several hundred miles in a day, have assignments to do that were due that night, stay up at a hotel, uh, down in the lobby, knock out the assignments, get back up the next day, drive several hundred miles and do it, you know, three, four, five days in a row until we get to Florida, start a new job, you know, move into the new house, this whole, you know, I mean, everything you can possibly do. And I was still able to graduate as valedictorian. It is not in any way because I'm smart. I am very average intelligence. <laughs> what, I can what I can tell you is, I think it's what you're talking about is, there's a huge difference between uh, motivation and discipline uh -huh. and focus and attention to detail and just a painful dedication to excellence, right? Mm -hmm. and it's almost an obsessive dedication to excellence. And the only, only reason I want to share that story or personalize anything that we're talking about is because, I mean, Let's, let's talk about what you just did, Ryan. You, you're married. You got a young baby. You're working two jobs. You're mm -hmm. slaving away, and you're still able to knock out this really interesting and cool project in this book that seemingly looks like it was kind of thrown at you in passing. You know, yeah. <laughs> and and I, you know, I commend you for that, brother, because thanks. I, I know what it takes to do this kind of stuff and how to do anything excellent, and you know. You know, my hat's off to you, my good buddy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my hat's off to you. Okay, so let me ask you this. <clears throat> Not to rabbit trail on that stuff too much. So, book is out. It's behind you. Are you proud of it? Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, th that's that's a worry that could happen if I am saying yes to opportunities. What if, what if I'm getting something that's like a, a turd that needs to be polished, right? Oh, um, yeah. This I'm, I'm totally thrilled. I'm, I'm happy with the people that I got to work with, yeah. um, with, with Frank and Eric and, and co-author Harry. Like I'm, I'm super thrilled to be a part of this project. I'm very proud of what we've done. Um, it looks good too. I mean, yeah, the cool, the, they, they have a good, um, we didn't have to design that. We just had to take the, uh, you know, take the screenshot of the, the software running um, and then they took care of the rest because they they've got a certain branding thing but I mean it, I like it it looks slick um, I I think the the balance of the information in it is well done um, if I had to start a you know a program from scratch or like a course from scratch and it was going to be an introduction to audio production kind of thing yeah. this book would be immensely helpful because of the way that it's 
um, paste and then the assignments that are within it. Um, so I'm super happy with it. I mean, there's that, that makes me excited to share, you know, the, the moment I found out that the book was coming out, um, you know, I went to Facebook, Instagram and, and started sharing. Um, I'm, I'm not the type to really like overly share. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit shy in, in that respect, but I knew that this was something that's worth getting over that anxiety and, and sharing. Um, cause I was proud of it. Um, Hey, real quick, we have a lot in common, but that is not one of them, dude. <laughs> if there is something dope going on, I'm gonna let you know about it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking at this. Uh, I'm looking at all the proper and appropriate use of the Oxford comma everywhere all over this too. It's awesome, man. And <laughs> funny thing too, I'm, as I'm reading uh, on the on the was it Roman.com site, Roman and Little Littlefield. Yeah. I'm reading through here, I see your. Uh, there's two links down here, details and author. I read your bio and I'm just really liking the last sentence. So to talk about what we're just talking about, Ray plays guitar and has composed for the production music library, Crime Songs. I'd like to see yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I knew you'd probably like that. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Make it bigger. I'm joking. <laughs> so what's going on now? So, so fill me in on life now. What are you doing? What are you planning on doing? you know, talk to me. Yeah. So, um, I'm still teaching, um, which is maybe a surprise to, to some, um, our, our schools were uh, effective in switching over to an online delivery. Um, and so I'm, I'm still at least partially with a job, which is nice. Um, a lot of people, you know, are at home. I am at home, but I'm able to, to get my work done here. So, What's funny is I, I still kind of have my same schedule before the shelter in place stuff was in effect. Yeah. And um, so I'm doing that, you know, three, three days a week. Um, I've got my classes going. Um, I've, you know, still taking care of the, the baby. Um, I've got some time around the house to, to work on little projects and things. Like one of the things that I've been super excited to, to get working on was um, the, the room that I'm in right now is my, my office studio. And it had kind of been a dumping ground for a little while. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got one thing you don't want to see in the living room, put it in the office. Ryan won't care. Um, yeah. And it, it just started to get a little bit cluttered. And even though I can function around cluttered environments and things like that, it just, it wasn't that inviting. Um, so I, I took some time and was able to clear out some things. So now my, my studio area is, is cleaner. Um, it's you know, some days it's like super clean and ready to go. So it's, it's in, you know, calling my name over to, to work on stuff. Um, so that's been really nice. Just getting an environment that inspires creativity, um, which is super important because yeah. what I'm, I'm hoping, you know, to get back in the swing of things is back on track with, with my production writing. Cause, um, as you were just bringing up with that final sentence of my bio, um, I have done some stuff that was included with Crime Sonics, and I want to continue that. Um, and it's just a matter of me sitting down and, and setting up the time to do so. So that's what's on on my mind of things to do. That and also trying to work on some um, some additional video training content and things that'll either supplement my classes or just be additional, um, you know, video tutorial stuff to share with the world. Well, there's two things I want to do before we, you know, get close to wrapping this uh -huh. episode of the podcast up. First, I'm just thinking about someone listening who is interested in possibly writing a book or creating some sort of PDF download or some sort of instructional content. What would you say to that person? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean... Would you recommend them? I mean, what, like, I, I, it's hard to articulate the question exactly, sure. but warnings and pitfalls and t talk to me about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I would say is, you know, number one, go for it. The more stuff you do, the more stuff you make, the more things you're going to have under your belt, the more experiences that you're going to build, even if it's something that 
is going to be difficult or possibly not end up being exactly how you want. The process of doing something is really, really educational and really beneficial in my opinion. Um, I mean, that's, that's just sort of what I picked up from my, my training in school is, you know, you're, you emulate composers by writing like them. You do all these things as a practice, even if it's not your best work, you've done it. So you understand what it takes to do it. Um, So that's my first thing that I would say is just, just go for it. I mean, it, you learn a lot from it. Um, don't be discouraged, even though it's very easy to be discouraged by, by failure in that respect. Um, the other thing I would say, which is maybe a, a, a useful approach to anything, um, much like using reference tracks, and that is go and, and look at some models of other things that you're trying to do. Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of how we learn what we do, whether it's language or an instrument or something else, we do a lot by observing, by analyzing, um, kind of resynthesizing the stuff that we've learned. And if you're trying to write something from scratch and you have no basis or comparison of what you're trying to do, that can be really daunting. And I mean, maybe, maybe you're somebody who's like a, a superhuman and can think of those things, but that's not how I am. Um, so I, I really like to kind of observe and analyze and, and do kind of some market research in the process to figure out like, what is something like this going to look like? What, what's layouts that are successful? What are things that work? And then try to incorporate those in my own way with my own content. So I'd recommend before even getting into the formal side of things to take some moments to do some really wide stretch research and, and figure out what could give you ideas. Yeah, no, it's it's very, it's very interesting that you brought this up and made the uh, the point of reference material because this is actually the second podcast I recorded today, and the first one was with Darren Leach, who does um, all the cover art for many of the production music libraries around the world. He's, in mm. my opinion, the best cover artist on earth, and he talked his you know, ad nauseum about this, about reference material with everything that you do, you know, stand on the shoulders of the giants that come before you kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Okay. So where can everyone get this book, dude? Uh, pretty much anywhere you search for books. Um, I've seen links on Amazon. I think Hal Leonard, um, the, the publisher site doesn't have a link to buy or they actually, they do. They, yeah. they do. I see it right here on screen. Yeah, um, yeah, and- Yeah. So, I mean, and anywhere that you buy books, you could probably find this book. Um, There is also an ebook offering and I haven't looked up that option to see what's available, but that's, that's also a, um, an available thing. And, um, and I think soon to come is um, there will be like a certification that's uh, attached to this text, meaning you can go through the text and go through the next point training certification and have a, have an industry certificate for it. So, yeah. Cool. L- last question I have. Sure. Logic Pro 10. What happens when Logic Pro 10.5 or Logic Pro 11 comes out? You guys going to do an updated version? That's a good question. I don't know. Fortunately, um, many of those updates, at least what I have seen in the last couple of years, have not been substantial enough to uh, affect the, the version of the book that's out right now. So, Agreed. you know, if you're concerned like, Oh no, the, the next point update just came out. Um, unless they're planning to do something drastically wild as an update. Um, the, I, I don't anticipate there being an, an immediate need, but I would imagine that um, at least in the contract, there's, there's mention of, um, you know, being available in case those things are, are possibilities. So um, I'm sure we'll keep it updated. I hope so. I'd love to be involved in that process, but um, yeah, that's, that's as far as I know. That is awesome, dude. And I'm looking at it here at roman.com. I think you also have a link at your personal website. What's your personal site? A personal site is just ryanray.com. Easy as it gets. All right, yep. Ryan, brother. Hey, thank you for taking the time to chat with me today and congrats on the baby and congrats on the book. Thank you very much, Dan. I really appreciate being here and and all the opportunities that you've extended. So really appreciate it.